Talk to us a little bit, Nico, about what you mean by multiple pillars of funding. What are those pillars for you? To me, the number one thing for me was I never wanted to be reliant on anybody but myself. I mean, who's the most important person in the world? You. We are. That's right. Everybody's the, the center of their own universe. We're individual in the world. We always are. I mean, our parents, they're biologically programmed to like us. Right. <laughs> okay? Biologically programmed to like us. You hope they are, right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, no one out there in the world really cares about you but yourself. Mm -hmm. And I never want to be in a position where at the end of the day or the end of the work week to put my hand out and say, can you please pay me? Mm -hmm. See, I wanted to create multiple pillars so effectively, you know, this was my personal empire. This was my personal business. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when did you get this idea in your head that you needed to do this? Well, I didn't want to pursue the, uh, the university route. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that was, just, that was my personal choice. Right. I mean, there's no right or wrong reason there. At the end of the day, you do what basically feels right by you. Right. And for me, I didn't want to pursue university because there was so much more out there in the world that I want to explore. Right. But it had to be on my own terms. And I had to be in control. Mm -hmm, at mm -hmm. all times. Now, at what point did you feel or did you get in your mind that, wow, if I did all this financial stuff, if I did what I was supposed to do, I could fund my own trillionaire experiences? I mean, I know the word trillionaire came about a bit later, but where, where did that concept come in? If I had the money, I could call my own shots anytime, anyplace, anywhere. Yep. I mean, growing up, we never did a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. So my parents were constantly working like 14, 15, 16 hour days. Mm -hmm. So I never saw my parents. So I understood the virtues of leverage, but also having alternate sources of income too. And I knew if I developed those different streams of income, then I would have the opportunity to travel and basically pursue my life on my own terms. And that was really, really important because my parents, they worked so hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hardly saw my parents. My dad would work and come home like once or twice every month. And I wow. knew there was so much more in life. And they did that for us kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and I never took that for granted. And I, and I, I, I totally loved my parents for, 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 for providing the scope for mm. us to have an education, mm -hmm. but also to have a choice in life. You see, we have a choice, but we, we don't exploit that choice. My understanding is that pretty much you help mom travel around the world now, though, don't I do, you? absolutely. <laughs> mom absolutely loves me. <laughs> Son, I need a little bit more money for another trip. <laughs> That's all good. And my mother deserves it. And she does deserve it. Now, let's go back to, uh, you're in Hollywood. Yep. You're 20 years old, you're buying property. When did you begin to really embark on this life of adventure after adventure after adventure? So basically, what my initial plans were to like um, become like, a successful musician, you know, to do a lot of session work and you know have an entire career musically and like tour around the world. Mm -hmm. And as I was pursuing that, basically all the money I was actually generating, I was basically investing in the property market. Mm -hmm. And this was around the early 1990s, mm -hmm. and there was a major recession around the globe. Right. You know, doom and gloom. Right. Everybody was just whining and whinging. There was unemployment going up. Economies were contracting, you know. Right. It was just this, this, an entire explosion of just sadness and just, you know, this... I couldn't believe the amount of emotions. Were, like, very similar to, like, right now, the, the entire crisis and what have you. Right. So for me, that was a perfect opportunity because, you know what? Where there's crisis, there is opportunity. That's right. This is the greatest opportunity. In fact, the best thing that can ever happen to you is for you to lose your job. Why? Because you start to think. And mm -hmm. when you start to think, you think of like different streams of income, a business, like on your passion points, what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And for me, to explore something that you love, that something that puts a smile on your face, that is life. And what was the, take me back to, when you first realized, wow, I have this freedom, I can go on these trillionaire experiences, what was the first big one? Probably the first one was like um, starting to climb mountains. And for me, that was an entire metaphor because I love the, uh, the fact when you reach a summit, uh -huh. that now becomes your support level. So effectively, once you get to a, an, an entire new resistance point, the polar opposite becomes support. Then you seek your next higher mountain. And yeah. it's, the very same, it's the very same way like when you reflect on goals or what have you. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that for a second because sometimes in talking to Nick, the challenge is that his everyday life is like most people's once in a lifetime experience. So when you say climbing mountains, you're not talking about, oh, let's go up this 9,000 foot here, let's go up this 8,000 foot here. Tell me a few of the mountains you've My been up. My first mountain was um, 20,000 feet. 20,000 feet. Yeah. Where is that? <laughs> Where was that? Well, I started out in Africa first mm -hmm. up, you know, and 
uh, there were some other mount mountains in California that I, that, that I had a, a practice run on it, but those practice runs were like at 10,000 feet. Right. So for me, I mean, you know, don't give me a little sand, you know, a little hill. Give me something that's just incredibly bold. It has to be a big adventure. Mm -hmm. It has to be sexy for me. I right. Mean, for, to like even gauge my interest. <laughs> right, right, right. And so which one was it? Uh, there was uh, Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro. Okay, so let's just see. This is what this one. You just have to stop, <laughs> Nick, and share with everybody else because otherwise you just miss it. First, I did a couple practice runs on a nine or ten thousand foot mountain yeah. in California. Then I went to Africa and climbed the Kilimanjaro. <laughs> and then what? Um, then from there, there was Orbras. There mm -hmm. was um, there was Aconcagua, which was the highest peak of the Andes. So Aconcagua. The so wait a second. So Aconcagua is in Argentina, right? Yes. I mean, now we're now in South so America. Became, Okay. I wanted to like um, summit the rooftop of every continent. The rooftop of every continent. Okay. Yeah. Now tell us what happened because I happen to know this story. So why don't you just share with us a little bit what happened when you're heading up Aconcagua in Argentina, just as an example. Well, first of all, um, our guides and the rest of our, our crew on the trip basically abandoned us because the reason being conditions became incredibly dangerous on the mountain. There was something called the uh, the Viento Blanco, which is the white winds. The white winds. And these hurling 140 mile an hour winds were basically causing, uh, were basically plaguing the mountain, right. causing havoc for the climbers. Mm -hmm. So as we were advancing up the mountain, there was a lot of people that were retreating. Right. And they, they just capitulated, gave up, and you know their physiology was totally depressed and what have you. Right, you head and down and everything. I refused to relinquish control to the mountain. Right. And you know, it's in life, there are certain opportunities you get. And for me, I want to be able to exploit every opportunity that comes my way. And so yeah. what happened? The whole, finish the story, because you refused to give up control to the mountain, and then what did the guides do, and what did everybody else do? Okay, well, they took all the food. They took all the food. In order to, like, provide an incentive for us to <laughs> get the hell off the mountain and what have you. Right, so they took your food so you wouldn't have any food, and you just kept going. Yeah. So there was, um, at the end of it, was uh, myself and um, uh, my cousin Christo. And we were pretty much confined Family. to a tent for about four or five days. We were trapped in an ice storm with very little food, and we were drawing straws who was going to go outside the tent to bring in the snow so we can melt it over the hot stove so we can have something to drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that lasted for four or five days. Yeah, and I never forget this because all we had for like um, entertainment was these little flutes that we bought back in Mendoza. And we'll just, we'll be there like every day, just like, you know just um, whistling to these little flutes and making little musical sounds and just cracking up. And then occasionally, I'll take the satellite phone and ring up my mother. Right. And ring up friends, you know. And it was like Christmas Day now, you know. <laughs> it was like having big Christmas dinners, you know. And like you're stuck. Big barbecues, what have you, like drinks and food. <laughs> and mother's going, I hope you're eating well. I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have no food. So you're stuck in a whiteout <laughs> and snow everywhere. And what happened at the end? At the end? Uh, on the last contingency day, I guess, the sun came out like it just it provided this amazing, um, the sight was just beautiful, it really was. I mean, mm -hmm. on the last day, wind stopped, the sun came out for a few hours, and we had our last ditch opportunity to like sprint to the top of the summit, which mm -hmm. we did in about, um, about 12 hours. And we finally, 12 hour sprint, okay. We finally <laughs> hit the summit, and we had a moment. We were on the rooftop of South America, yeah. South American sunrise. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and <laughs> this guy's just ridiculous. So a 12 hour sprint to the top and you're coming down. It's now getting close to New Year's. You don't want to miss the New Year's okay. Eve party. That so. so that was the inspiration. Like it's New Year's. You don't be trapped on the mountain or like stuck in a tent. So I mean, I want to like go out and just, you know, have fun. So I grabbed the satellite phone. Right. And we chartered a helicopter. <laughs> So you chartered a helicopter. Now, mind you, we're at 23,000 feet. Helicopters have a ceiling height of about 15,000 feet. Right. It's got to do with um, density of air. And the rotor blades need um, density of air to, to grab onto. So we were forced to go down to 15,000 feet right. before the helicopter would even consider to pick us up. Right. So you went down to 15,000 feet, helicopter picks you up, and you don't miss the New Year's Eve party. Exactly. So... We chop it off the mountain at 15,000 feet, all the way down to Mendoza, and then New Year's Eve, we're out there partying with Argentinians. So, <laughs> got it. Otherwise, we that, That's normally what I do on a New Year's Eve day, you know, chop her out of a 15,000 foot mountain after hanging out in a snow blizzard for five days with no food. That's pretty much normal. Mind you, we were ghastly sized. I mean, I had a beard. I mean, I, 
you know, like a like a three four week um, growth, you know. Right. But it was just just it was great just to like finally shave, put some clothes on, put some jeans, and just go out and party. It was great. I loved it. <laughs> Plus, South America too. I mean, what a continent. The, the, the place where people stay up till 5 o'clock in the morning every day and don't even think about the discotheque's empty at midnight, but at 1 o'clock in the morning it fills <laughs> up again, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. Let's go back to Thrillionaires. Yeah. And, and obviously, people that are learning a bit about the Thrillionaire concept and who you are get the idea, wow, you had lunch on the bow of the Titanic, you were trained as an astronaut, you're set to go to the International Space Station. You've orbited the Earth in a MiG-25. You've crossed the desert with Tuaregs on camels or whatever. Why now, or what is it that drove you to say, wait, we need to take this to the world. Other people can do this. Let's support everybody else in the idea of a thrillionaire lifestyle. First of all, I'm not genetically different to any person in the world. I mean, I had obstacles, I had health issues, but Everybody can do this. I mean, look, how many times have we all grown? We've all grown up, and we've all like we've all had specific goals, whether it's traveling, or like, um, or you know, having a career of choice as opposed to like a job of necessity. We've all had some type of aspiration, whether it's to raise a family and have raise beautiful kids and what have you. And you know, we've always had something that we mm -hmm. wanted to pursue. But how many of us relinquish control of our goals and dreams, and we allow somebody else to draft the circumstances of our life? Mm -hmm. It happens every time. Yeah, it does.